So during the primary, he was conducting his primary from uh, from the airplane, I guess. They, they would call in, have a question, and he would uh, answer the question or talk to somebody at the doorstep. Um, and he won his primary. He, he was the leading vote-getter in the primary. There were a number in the primary, so he didn't have quite have 50 percent. But in the um, uh, runoff, he uh, won that quite handily. And I spent about an hour or so with him uh, for breakfast one morning after he got back and was just delighted. Uh, I think he has great leadership ability and I'd like to bring him in here sometime when we don't have a special speaker and uh, talk a little bit more about himself and uh, perhaps get an endorsement. But uh, of course I've already given him my endorsement. But uh, Jay Stiegel, could you come up and just talk to us a couple minutes and let us meet you? Oh, well, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Jay Stegall. Uh, as you probably didn't know already. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I live out in Yukon. Been there about uh, 14 years. I know a few of the folks here uh, in the room. It's good to see you guys again. Uh, yeah, I was deployed during the primary race, and uh, luckily I had a really strong volunteer team and an awesome wife and a good campaign strategist. We put together a really good plan. Uh, finished strong in the primary, and then. Uh, of course, like Bob said, we couldn't help but uh, get in a runoff because there were four of us all running for the same seat. You guys know how that works. Uh, so, uh, finished really strong in the uh, in the runoff, and we're looking forward to uh, this fall and finishing strong there as well. I, I do fly KC-135. I tell people I pass gas. <laughs> and occasionally we refuel other airplanes too. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll discuss more of that. Maybe I'll put together a few uh, slides uh, for you guys next time that we meet up and kind of give you a little better idea of what we do while we're up in the air. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate your support. And uh, Oak Pack, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, not only this fall, but uh, next session. And uh, maybe we can get things moving in the right direction. Thanks, guys. All right. I... Um I'm, I'm so pleased to have our next speaker, Mark Mariota, who has uh, transformed our work comp system single-handedly. No, wait a minute, he had a helper. So let me introduce also, is it retired Brigadier General? Yes. Hopper Smith. Uh, my son, who's a, a, a captain in the Army, actually did a report for him uh, some years ago. I asked him if Hopper liked the report. He said, probably not. <laughs> but it's all I could say. You know, somebody, somebody messed up and... It was my court-martial. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, at any rate, we're pleased, Hopper, to have you here. And Hopper's a longtime friend of uh, Oak Pack. But Mark uh, was asked uh, about five years ago, the state of Oklahoma voted to somehow revamp our uh, work comp system. And I, I remember that as if it was, was yesterday, but now I, I no longer remember the details. I just know it was making it better. And so um, the governor called uh, Mark and asked if he would come and help make all of that uh, a reality. And uh, so he agreed to do that. Mark actually has a military background himself. Uh, as an officer, I think, in the 45th D Division, he's exercised a leadership role and has had numerous awards and uh, decorations. I think if you wore his military uniform, you'd have a lot of those colorful things over here. And um, probably his big claim to fame is his cattle ranch, the L7 cattle ranch. And um, L is for Leota, and seven is the number of people in his family. I thought maybe it was the number of cows he had. But uh, it's a little pastime he has. But he spent five years, or excuse me, five terms in the Oklahoma legislature, so he's very knowledgeable about that. He looks too young to have done all this stuff. But uh, Mark, if you would come up here, uh, you can use this mic or the mic over there, either one, your choice. And uh, appreciate you being here. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. That's good and loud. Thank you uh, for that introduction. You stole all my thunder. Uh, I'll have to rethink what I was going to say. Um, I, I am very impressed with the size of this crowd to come out and hear about workers' comp. I know workers' comp is exciting, but uh, I, I'll try to I'll try to make it interesting. So um, he told you a little bit about my background. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is important 
that I bring to the role of workers' comp commissioner that I also brought to the legislature is I spent 18 years uh, in a small business in Tulsa. Uh, when I went to work there, we had five employees. When I left, we had 50 employees and offices in three states. So that's my education. I got to watch what it takes to build a business uh, in a regulatory environment and the things that work, the things that don't work, and the cost of government to building a business. Um, and so I, I bring that. Additionally, I, I started literally in a ditch with a shovel in my hand and ended up the HR manager. And so I dealt with our workers' comp issues. I dealt with uh, employees' injuries from uh, holding a, a guy's hand closed that had just been crushed until the ambulance arrived to uh, keeping our rates down by managing our safety program. So. Uh, that's my workers' comp background. I'm not a lawyer, um, but my background is in um, keep, keeping, well, dealing with OSHA, uh, but keeping the rates of the company down, keeping the employees safe, and accomplishing the mission at the same time. So uh, I think that's an important uh, uh, knowledge and background to bring to the commission. Uh, the other two commissioners are attorneys. Well, that's that's obviously uh, important, but uh, um, I, I like to think I bring the uh, kind of the ground level um, of workers' comp to the commission. Um, as as was mentioned, um, the com the commission started uh, in February of 2014. Uh, the legislature created us in 2013 to replace the old workers' comp court. Now. Charlie Key. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, now I have to tell the truth. <laughs> um, and so, how did we get there? Well, I think all of you can remember the, uh, the situation in Oklahoma regarding workers' comp for decades. It was extremely expensive, uh, and I'll just say it bluntly, uh, it had devolved into a system that was not designed to get injured workers treatment and get them back to work. It was designed to make money for attorneys and for, uh, and for some uh, possibly not injured workers. It, it, was, a, it was a system that had, had devolved into what we didn't want. And um, when I was there, previous to me being in the legislature, when I was in the legislature, and for many years after, there was bill after bill after bill to try to fix the workers' comp court system. And, and some of them had some success, but uh, in 2014 or 2013, the legislature decided, let's stop monkeying around with this. Let's just replace the old court system with the commission. And, and take, really the, em the uh, emphasis was to try to take cases out of trial, get them away from going through the expensive, costly process of going through trial. And so uh, the legislature created the commission. Now the commission and the court are both existing at the same time right now. And that was one of the concerns is, uh, one of the concerns was, well, it's going to be very expensive to operate two systems. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. The, re the results have not borne that out. <clears throat> it, it is working very well. The court, in, in the current statute, is designed to dissolve in 2020. Uh, there need to be some fixes to that statute to enable that, but uh, so the old court is intended to dissolve in 2020 and the commission continue on. So I told you a little bit about my, my background, my workers' comp background. Um, the, when the commission first started, its first year, you may remember, was a little rough. Uh, they were in the paper every other week for doing something stupid, embarrassing, or illegal. Um, they had some bad legal advice. They were not following the, the State Open Meetings Act correctly. Um, and uh, after about oh, um, after about a year of it, the legislature started to to uh, try to rein them in, and the governor decided I need to get some different people in there. This is in no way a criticism of the original three commissioners. Um, it's just that it's very difficult to start up a brand new state agency right next to one that doesn't want it to exist with a whole cadre of workers' comp attorneys that didn't want it to exist. 
So to their credit, they did get it up and running. And they did so, the first three months they didn't even have funding. Um, but they made some mistakes, and I think that's, that's part of a larger issue that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'll just describe it. Um, she brought in three commissioners that had never run a small agency or a small business and didn't have that experience to start up a new agency and put all of the foundational things that you would expect, like an employee manual, written policies, organizational chart, all those things that you would expect, they just didn't really understand the value of, um, and it, it, created, it created a lot of situations. So, the governor asked me to come in, fix the problems, and get us out of the paper. And so I spent the next, um, really focused the next three months on identifying the problems, and the way I did that is I interviewed every single employee. At that time, we had about 35 employees. My thought was, I'm not going to understand it unless I understand it from a uh, grassroots level. And so I talked to absolutely every single employee, and that's all I did for three weeks. After about three days, it was pretty clear what the problems were. But by talking to the employees, it let them know I was there to understand and not just come in and start making changes. I earned their confidence. Uh, it also let me see what, what the caliber of employees I had. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, you can walk into a lot of state agencies and you can tell these folks don't care. Well, the folks I had, they cared about the process and they wanted it to succeed. Okay, I can work with that. I was very happy to see that. Now, I, I will tell you that I fired four, four employees pretty quick. Um, we had at least two of them that couldn't even tell me what they did. Um, and that, that's, that's the reality of, of uh, management that, that needs a tweak. Um, uh, and so I, I, uh, I got to know the employees, got to know the problems, and they were, they were foundational. Um, structure, management structure was very weak. Uh, communication was abysmal. It was the worst I've ever seen. Uh, they, they were doing things because they didn't understand the Open Meetings Act, they were doing things that could be could be considered in secret and uh, having and this has all been in the paper I'm not telling you anything new um, they were approving contracts without doing it in an open open meeting they were doing um, all kinds of business at the agency without doing it in an open meeting they didn't understand the open meetings act uh, and so and the communications with the employees in 15 months they hadn't even had a staff meeting where you just bring everyone together and say here's what we do here what problems are you having those kinds of things um, and then uh, processes. They hadn't identified their processes, detailed them, flow charted them, anything. Well, um, anybody who's been in the military understands the benefits of a flow chart. Uh, but the ability to explain your processes uh, and go back to them when you have a problem, um, they just didn't have that in place. So we put all those things in place pretty quick because they're not hard. Um, you just have to understand their value. Additionally, they didn't have any HR processes in place, and that's one thing I've, I've kind of seen pretty regularly. Um, some folks in management don't understand the value of HR. Uh, it's as close to an in-house attorney as you, as you sometimes have, and they, HR allows you to develop your staff. And so we put those in place. So those are the problems that we found. We, we fixed them, we, we put them right, and so I'm here today to tell you the results, not only of what we put in place, but more importantly, the results of the workers' comp reform that was passed in 2013. So, believe it or not, I'm here from state government to tell you something good, something that is working, something that is positive in uh, Oklahoma State government. And so we'll go to the first slide. As soon, soon as Hopper figures it out. Well, I'll keep talking while he's figuring it out. Um, so let me talk a little bit about where we were. As you remember, um, Oklahoma was ranked, I think, third worst in the country in terms of the workers' comp system. Now think about that. 
little old Oklahoma was right up there with New York and California and New Jersey and Alaska in terms of how costly and difficult our workers' comp system was. So much so that insurance companies didn't even bother to sell workers' comp here. We had to create a state-run entity to provide workers' comp because we couldn't get insurance companies to come here because what they found was it wasn't worth it to sell the product because they would lose the cases almost on a regular basis. And so we didn't have the, the uh, competitiveness, the competitive market that enabled insurance companies to even consider coming here, which drove costs up. Um, the, the, the blinking benefits that the system provided were way out of whack with what would be considered reasonable. That drove costs up. Um, the, just every aspect, and we'll get into it a little bit here if we get the get the thing going up. Um, Every aspect of providing workers' comp in Oklahoma is more expensive than most other states. When I was in the legislature, we had businesses come to us regularly. Uh, I, I think of Michelin uh, down in south, uh, southeast Oklahoma or south central Oklahoma. They would show us on a regular basis, look, we've got a plant in South Carolina and a plant here in Oklahoma. Our workers' comp in Oklahoma is three to five times more than a comparable plant in South Carolina, and we're thinking about moving. And we're thinking about moving every time we, we pay this bill every month. Uh, and that, that was a common frustration of, of businesses that existed here. And it was, a, it was commonly looked at for businesses that were considering coming here. Um, if, if, you, if you could just plan on your workers' comp costs being three to five times what it would be across the border in Texas or Arkansas, um, they, it drove them away. It was a very large drag on our system um, and, and consequently that's why we we continuously ran bills to try to try to uh, repair uh, the system that was in place um, I think Hopper's uh, doing a, a call to see if we can get uh, some help <laughs> so while he's doing that maybe there's some preliminary questions I can answer yes sir is that one of the uh, reasons May Cool didn't come to Oklahoma? I, I don't know, and that I when 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 did they decide? Two years ago, they left Colorado because it became California, and then uh, they started looking for someplace else. And we wanted them to come here, and they didn't. And it was, I think it was because of our business environment. I, I don't. I, my guess would be if it was more than three years ago, that was part of it. Uh, because it was part of the cost of doing business and uh, Magpul being in manufacturing that that's a higher cost because uh, you have actual injuries in, in manufacturing so um, I, I would I would suspect that's part of it yes sir how did you deal with OSHA? say again how did you deal with OSHA? how did I deal with OSHA? Um, when I was the HR manager I, I tried to deal with them very little um, <laughs> and, and really um, Safety is the way you avoid it. Uh, that, that's just the reality. Um, if, if you have a, um, an event and then another event and another event, well, they're going to start looking at you. They're going to start uh, being um, intrusive in what you're doing. Um, you know, we reported all our injuries that uh, were reportable. Um, but our safety program where I worked, uh, worked. Uh, we were a construction and manufacturing company. We, we did work for pipeline companies. Um, it, it's Mesa Products in Tulsa and Mesa Corrosion Control. We provided systems for pipelines and storage tanks that protect them from corrosion. And so we did a lot of dirt work uh, to get down to the pipeline, um, installing systems in tank farms, those kinds of things. So heavy equipment operation. And then we also opened a manufacturing plant for the materials used in that industry. And so we, we had injuries uh, because the, the kind of work we did uh, was that could be dangerous but at the same time uh, because our program was so successful our experience modification rate which is what the insurance companies apply to you and apply to your workers comp rates was a positive uh, we had a excuse me a negative we had a 0.74 modifier that's unheard of in construction and manufacturing typically they're going to be closer to a two um, I've seen threes uh, 
and that gets applied to well here's your what your workers comp rate uh, would be for a, a typical company and your experience either multiplies it or subtracts from it we operated with a 0.75 so now, sorry about the blinking screen That's, yeah all right we're up and going Okay, the first slide, I know you can't read it, but it's our organizational chart. And really the point is just to show you, we have one. And it is um, short, flat. Flat, excuse me, flat and wide instead of tall and narrow. And the purpose of that is so that, um, or the benefits of that are so that the front line is only a couple of steps, that the, the uh, um, operations are only a couple of steps from the commissioners. That improves communication both directions um, it allows the front the operations folks to understand uh, more about how important and what and how they are a part of the organization and so we have a, a very simple um, organization that uh, improves communication and efficiency uh, it, it's uh, we're led by three commissioners that are appointed by the governor to six-year staggered terms my term is up in 2021 the other two commissioners, one's up in 19, and the other one, I think, is up in 24. Um, the statute does not require that we're an attorney, and I think the legislature did that on purpose, uh, so that they would have other voices uh, directing the commission, directing the work of the commission. Um, we, we employ five administrative law judges. Uh, the, those judges hear the cases if you have a workers' comp claim with your insurance company, your company's insurance company, and everything goes well, we never hear from you. We never see you. You're not part of the system. If you're not receiving the benefits you, you should be, you believe you should be, or if you're an employer, you believe this is a phony claim, I, I shouldn't have to be paying this, then your case comes to us. And so at that point, it goes from a claim to a case. We deal with cases, not claims. And so if, you, if your case is heard by one of our uh, administrative law judges and you don't like the ruling, then your case will move to the, the appellate level, which is the three commissioners. We hear the cases that are appealed from the ALJs, and then they go from us. If you're appealed from us, they go to the Supreme Court. Now, you'll, you'll hear that a lot of the, the workers' comp reform that was passed in 2013 has been kicked out by the courts. That's not true. Um, there was one very specific kind of add-on that was called opt-out that allowed you to write your own workers' comp plan as long as it met certain criteria. Well, the Supreme Court threw it out because, in effect, it was, treat it was treating some Oklahomans different than the rest, and you can't write a law that does that. It's unconstitutional. That's a very boiled down, non-attorney description of what the court said. Um, and so that's generally how we, we operate. The first slide is really one of the, the most uh, significant results of workers' comp reform. On the left, the kind of blue, I'm colorblind, so help me out here, kind of blue um, side is 2001 to 2012 the cases that were filed in the state of Oklahoma under the old workers' comp court. They averaged about 16,000 cases filed in a year. Then workers' comp reform happened in 2013, and so on the right side, in the green, are the cases that have been filed since workers' comp reform. We are staying below 8,000, and I think this year, 2017-2018, uh, will continue to stay right at or below 8,000. And so on average, we're seeing about half of the number of cases filed statewide as a result of the workers' comp reform. Okay, so what, what would explain that? What would be in that 50% that aren't being filed? Because we're not any safer. We still have the same number of uh, injuries happening on average. We've actually added some employment, which should push those numbers up some. So what is in that, that upper 50%? My response is, this is just my opinion, a percentage is fraud. You're always going to have fraud in any system. So a percentage of it uh, is fraud. 
Well, when you make the system less profitable to file cases, you make it significant, significantly less profitable to violate the law and file a phony case. And so, and we've seen that borne out in the, uh, the Attorney General's office. Uh, they have significantly dropped um, their resources applied to fraud cases because they just don't have any cases to work on. The number of fraud cases in workers' comp has uh, dramatically dropped. Okay, this After your presentation, I've taken this computer <laughs> to the range and <laughs> I, I can keep talking. Um, and so, a percentage is fraud. Well, what is the rest? Let's say 45% of that 50%. If, uh, again, if there's no profit to be had in filing a case, attorneys aren't going to file the case. They, they evaluate the case to see well, is it in my financial interest to file this case? If they don't see any benefit, any profit, they don't file the case. And what happens? Well, the injured worker gets his treatment and goes back to work. And we don't have a case. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit to that. Um, I think that's one of the evils in the old system, uh, in the old culture, that we're changing. Um, because it was profitable, and, and let me give a little bit of preamble. Uh, I'm in no way insulting intentionally attorneys. They're business people. They make business decisions. But um, in the old system, it was profitable to stretch the case out and to reset and reset and reset because the attorneys made more money on the case over that period of time. Well, what did that do to the injured worker? His focus went from, when am I going to get my treatment so I can get back to work, to when's my case going to get heard? When's this hearing going to happen? When's this hearing going to happen? Okay, what am I going to get out of this, this case? How much money am I going to make out of this case? Their focus shifted from getting treatment and back to work to a, a payout in many cases. Well, that's not the system that we wanted, that we, cre that we intended. It's a system that devolved over time. And I think that's, a, that's probably the main thing that we're changing with the new system is we're moving cases through the system much faster. And that's a good segue to the next slide, except it looks like we've... It, is it the next slide? Okay. Um, a good segue to that. Um, we are moving cases much faster through the system. I don't have a slide for this, but I can tell you that, we're, and we're studying the numbers, in the old system, a case took a year to two years to get through the system, just just the case, not the treatment, just the case. We're now seeing cases, uh, the average case go through the system in less than nine months. And until I'm much more confident in the numbers, I'm not gonna give you a number, but I will tell you it's much less than nine months. We're moving ca cases on average much faster tr through the system. The other thing to remember is when you cut out the fraud and the, the cases that weren't real cases, what are you left with? You're left with real workers' comp cases on the average, which are more expensive and take longer to get through the system. So the fact that we're moving them through faster than the old court, I think that's significant. The next slide is one of my favorites, because I found these numbers. Um, this is the disposition trends. And so it starts over there in May of 14 when we had our first cases and goes through uh, September of 17. We need to update that. We've got a few more months behind us. Um, the orange line on the bottom are cases that go to trial at the commission. The purple line at the top are cases that go somewhere else, either through mediation or uh, joint petition, where they just get together and figure out we're, we're both agreeable to this, or they're dismissed, or they're dropped by the uh, injured worker, um, some other direction. Well, that was one of the major uh, impetuses of workers' comp reform was to get cases out of trial. And the significant aspect of this is that gap between the orange line and the purple line is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. More and more cases, they're finding, we don't need to take this to trial. We can do a mediation or we can just come to an agreement. And sometimes it happens right there in front of the judge. He'll, he'll start hearing the case and says, why don't you guys go out in the hall and talk about this aspect of this case? Because 
I don't think you really have a case here. And they'll go outside and figure it out. That, uh, to me, that's one of the most significant changes in the workers' comp system is more and more cases are avoiding the expensive route of trial. And the next slide shows you that. We took one of those eventualities, which was mediation. In uh, 2014, we had our first mediation cases. We had 43 in that year. The next year, 621. The next year, 1199. The next year, 1552. Over the life of the commission, we've had a 150% increase since our first year in cases going to mediation. The mediation system works. Uh, we, we pay an attorney or a, a professional mediator to hear the case and bring both sides to some kind of agreement. The next slide is another significant, um, of course I wouldn't have brought anything that wasn't significant to me, but um, <laughs> another significant measure of the system comparing us to the old court system. On the left, from 2001 to 2013, 2012 actually, you have the number of cases that go to appeal in the old court system. And they averaged about a thousand cases a year went to appeal. It's about a hundred a month. Over, and then you had a workers' comp reform in 2014. Then over on the right, you see the number of our cases that go to appeal. The old court averaged about a thousand. We averaged about a hundred a year. We're hearing about eight appeals a month. A significant, dramatic drop in the expensive aspect of a trial going to appeal. To me, that, that is um, probably the most dramatic measure of how the system is working. They're happy with the way we're hearing their cases. They're happy with both sides, the injured worker, the employer, the insurance company, they're happy with the result they're getting. Now, I need to back up. Somebody's not happy. There's always going to be somebody not happy. I, I recognize that. And, and, <laughs> and, and one that we need to recognize, um, and it probably here is a good place to do it, um, when a system is this far out of whack, the tendency is to uh, reform it this far out of whack. And we did. Uh, we significantly cut, in addition to everything else, we cut benefits to the injured worker. That's a reality. Uh, if you compare Oklahoma's benefits to the rest of the country, we're in the bottom tier. Our benefits have cut, been cut dramatically. Um, and that is something that I think the legislature, the Chamber of Commerce, they're beginning to recognize that um, they need to take a look at. And, that, and so what brought it to mind is, a lot of times the injured worker isn't happy with their benefits because they are significantly uh, below what would be considered a, a national average. It's just a reality of the system. Um, when you reform that far out of whack, the court, as cases are appealed to the Supreme Court, they begin to bring us back, slowly but surely, to a point, I think, of equilibrium where this side's not happy, this side's not happy. Okay, that's about where you belong. That's about right. And I think you see that in, in systems across the, across the spectrum. Um, no one should be winning. Both sides should be winning as much as you can. And I think that's where the Supreme Court has brought us. And we've actually gotten there much quicker than I thought we would. I thought it would be a long period of cases dragging through the system. But they've really uh, brought us to a good point. And I think their focus, from their rulings, their focus has been the statute unfairly or inappropriately limits a judge's ability to make a decision one way or the other. That's the Supreme Court's focus. And we've seen that in their rulings. They, if the statute says, judge, you have to do this, if it gets challenged, the Supreme Court says, that's a little unreasonable. That judge can make that determination on a case-by-case -case basis. And so they throw out the, the limitation. That's the kind of things we've been seeing from the Supreme Court. Okay, so what are the monetary results? I've given you some of the kind of functionary results. Um, and so what, what has happened to premiums in the state of Oklahoma? Well, in 2013, the aggregate premiums paid by businesses in Oklahoma was almost a billion dollars to insurance companies for workers' comp. Uh, $961.5 million. Uh, 
And so that's about when reform happened. So the next year we see a drop to 910 million, the next year to 792 million, the next year to 672 million, and this last year to 656 million. Overall, we've seen a 31.6% drop in workers' comp premiums paid by businesses in the state of Oklahoma to insurance companies. That's, that's about $300 million that no longer is going to, a lot of times, out-of-state uh, insurance companies that is staying in the pockets of Oklahoma business folks that they can then plow back into their business or into their employees' pay, whatever they decide they need to spend that money on. So this is a significant uh, shot in the arm to Oklahoma business, removing the expense of unreasonably expensive workers' comp. The, uh, that 31% drop is a result of underwriters in the insurance industry looking at what they call loss costs, the loss drivers in workers' comp. Well, those loss costs have dropped 60%. Our loss costs have dropped faster than any other state in the nation. And I look at loss costs as the anchor pulling down the premium balloon. If loss costs have dropped 60%, premiums have only come down 30%, I think over the next three to five years, you're going to continue to see this trend go down, a reduction in uh, premiums in the state of Oklahoma. Next slide. The next slide is very, is very interesting. Looks <laughs> like we've had a lockup, so I can, I can talk a little bit more about this. Um, I think the next slide is our uh, bookends. I believe that's the next. But as soon as I get this queued back up, it will be. Okay. And, uh, you know, premiums are what legislators hear about from their uh, business constituents. Um, and so repairing the system to reduce premiums significantly. Uh, that, that's something that legislators can go back to their district and, and brag about, that um, they were part of repairing the system and uh, reducing costs. Um, the, uh, and, and as I said, I, I think the next three to five years will, will continue. Uh, one maybe humorous to some folks uh, aspect of that is the Workers' Comp Commission is not funded by the state of Oklahoma. We receive no appropriations from the state. Our funding is a 1% tax on workers' comp premiums. So think about that. If premiums are going down, 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 well, that's the basis of our funding. <laughs> so we're working ourselves out of a job, which I kind of like that, but uh, the reality is we still have to provide the service. And uh, another, another consideration that uh, sometimes folks throw at me is, uh, well, if you're reducing the number of cases being filed and you have half of what the court had and um, and your your other costs are going down well then you don't need any more money do you well that that would that would make sense but my my retort is if you're suiting up for one game or suiting up for the whole season you're still suiting up the same number of players you still have to provide the service and um, it it costs money to provide that service uh, I'll tell you that um, we, we receive, I think it's three million currently from the uh, tax on workers' comp premiums. We bring in about two million in fines and fees, and, and that'll, that'll, I can tell you a little bit about the fine process. And then um, that total, that, that's about five million. Um, our actual spend is about seven million. We are uh, currently living off of um, money that was divided between us and the old court when we were, we were put together. When the commission was first started, they were put together with the old court. Supreme Court stepped in and said, mm, you can't do that. That's a court. You're not a court. And so they split us, and that, that money that the court had was divided between us. We're, we're living a little bit on that money. Wait, I have no, uh, no idea how long this is going to last. Okay. Um, now, you, you absolutely cannot see this, but I will, tell, I will describe it for you. Um, this is what I call the bookends. This is 2012's um, 
study from the state of Oregon. It's called the Oregon study. And what I like about it is it's unbiased because it's some other state looking at the rest of the states. If you'll notice, down at the bottom is Oklahoma. We were worst in the country in terms of the increase in the cost of workers' comp. We were at 19.8%. We were beating everyone else. Every other state, we were the worst state in the nation in 2012. Then workers' comp reform happened in 2014, so I'll come over to the 2016 study. We're the best in the state in decreasing, decreasing our workers' comp costs. So worst in the state, reform happens, best in the state over a four-year, excuse me, best in the nation, over a four-year period. You, we don't get to say that very often, uh, going from worst to best in four years. But, uh, and the 2018 should be coming out pretty soon. I don't expect us to still be at the top, but I expect us to be close to the top because we've continued to beat all the other, a lot of the other states in terms of reducing our costs. Okay, maybe next slide. Yay. Okay, uh, the next few slides are about costs, about the cost of providing a workers' comp system. And again, the concern was we're going to have two systems running in parallel. That's going to be very expensive. Well, it hasn't borne out. Um, what you see here is the number of employees at the commission in green and the number of employees at the court in blue. The court started with 72 employees. Of those, 14 were judges. Then the commission comes online. We started with 32 employees, and the court kept, kept their folks. Then the next year, the commission started to fill in, and the court realized, we don't have anything to do. I, I'm exaggerating. They had very little, very, a lot less to do, so they cut down to 31. The next year, we continued to fill out in the commission. The, the court kept about where they are, and the commission has settled in. Actually, that 42 is incorrect. We're at 40 now. Um, and the court has dropped to 26. So if you had 42 and 26, that's 68. The two agencies combined are less than where the court was when we started. So there was some initial startup cost, but that has, it has not uh, continued because efficiency and reducing cost is one of my focuses. It's one of the commission's focuses. Um, we, if we don't, if we don't have a need, we don't spend the money and we're constantly looking for ways to reduce the need. As a matter of fact, um, I just eliminated two positions in this last month and we're not refilling them because we don't need them. We, we implemented uh, electronic data interchange, is that right, EDI? And the purpose of that was to reduce the amount of paper that we're dealing with. We have 69 paper forms, this is 2018. Uh, and so we implemented electronic data interchange so our insurance companies could deal with us electronically instead of uh, only through paper. They still have the paper option, but uh, it's mandatory that they participate in the electronic. And that helped me eliminate uh, two data entry positions. When our case management system, new case management system comes online, I should be able to eliminate more. Uh, and I have no reason to replace them, so we're, we eliminated those positions. And just to give you a a round figure that's about $100,000 that I reduced out of our uh, labor expense. Another way to look at it, um, this is the, the cost per full-time equivalent, uh, the cost divided by the number of full-time equivalents at the commission. Um, no, I didn't. Yeah, I did it. Uh, I felt my thumb click it off. Uh, at the beginning of the commission, it was a little erratic, but we settled in, and you can see our, our staffing numbers have stayed fairly consistent, even trending down. Uh, this bump here at the end is the state pay raise, um, and you can see it's trending back down again. Um, that's one of my focuses is when, when I worked in the private sector, I always worked a person short whenever I could. Uh, and you can do that for about nine months. If you've kept a division, a person short for, about, short for about nine months, they're either going to figure out how to do it without them, or in nine months, that's a pretty good indicator you need to fill that position. That's been one of my strategies uh, all along. So we've kept our, our labor costs controlled. Uh, next slide. Now these are all the other costs, personal services, salaries, benefits, professional services, travel, equipment, any other operating 
costs. The first column is the court's expenses in 2012 with 74 employees, 72, 74, long in there. I think this is the updated 2018 one. Well, no, it's not. It's the 2017 numbers. Well, the 2018 numbers are about the same. Um, these are the commission's numbers. And the final column is the percentage decrease comparing the commission to the old court. Uh, the total decrease is about 33% in expenses with a labor drop of 45%, almost 46% in number of employees. Okay. Um, I, and I will, how much time do I have to answer questions? About five minutes. Okay, great. Assuming that I left any questions in your mind. I think you answered everything. We had no questions. Uh, <laughs> right over here, Ms. Costello. Oh. So, so I, I have both a comment. I, I have a comment and a question, if I may. Uh, just to add to this story, uh, in 2011, the last elected labor commissioner, Mark Costello, and I started a 501c3 called Workers' Comp, not Lawyers' Comp. <laughs> His desire was to raise the awareness of everything you're talking about when he studied that we were spending $19,000 to process a claim in Oklahoma and $7,000 in Texas, $2.52 here compared to Arkansas. In 2011, he went to leadership and he said, this is something we need to change. This adversarial program has been in place since 1948 under Gene Stein. He got complete and total pushback. He was shut. Sorry, that was See, he's mad. <laughs> he, he, he was completely shut down, and we discussed it, and, and we talked about the fact that this is the right thing to do for the people of Oklahoma. So he worked on that, he worked with the Senate, he went to Arkansas, he sat down with the labor commissioner, or not the, the uh, workers' comp commissioners in Arkansas to promote this. So it was, it was kind of the impetus to get this moving in the right direction. I'm so glad to see that it is. Uh, having said that, um, the new title, the administrative system is Title 85A. It's 130 pages. I've, I've read it. Um, Section 20, line 5 uh, states that the Labor Commissioner now has latitude and ability for rule change. So my question for you is, do you see this as a positive, working with workers' comp, a negative, or do you see some relationship moving forward there? And by the way, in traveling the state and talking to employers for the past 12 months, they are very happy with the new, as an employer, not all employees are, right. I've heard some complaints, but employers are very happy with the new system. But any comments on that new rule change on, on uh, uh, Section 20, Line 5? Well, uh, you reminded me that I brought my general counsel with me. <laughs> Always travel with your attorney. Uh, Sarah Greenwald is our general counsel and is doing a wonderful job uh, helping us not make fools of ourselves. Um, it's which, job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm actually not familiar with um, the specific uh, uh, aspect that, if I understand you right, it, al it allows the labor commissioner to make rules that affect us. Well, we need to look at that because I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with that. Thank you. We, we write our own rules in terms of the way we operate the system. Um, I would be very surprised that they gave the Labor Department some ability to affect our rules. So I'll, I'll check into that. Thank you. Yeah. I was just curious yes, how you eliminate all the fraudulent cases. Well, again, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of the, the structure of the system. If it doesn't, if, if an attorney doesn't see, or, now, let me, let me clarify, I'm not suggesting that attorneys file fraudulent cases. I'm not suggesting that. Um, if, uh, if they see that there's no money to be made in a case, that significantly drops the impetus to file a fraudulent case because you, you will go to jail. I mean, there are significant consequences for a fraudulent workers' comp case. Um, and so I think that's how you fix those kinds of things, is you eliminate the, the, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Incentive. The incentive, thank you, um, to, to file a fraudulent case. And, the, uh, and it's been borne out, uh, the AG's office obviously is, you know, very interested in following up on those cases and, and um, prosecuting them because, it's politically popular to prosecute those, just to be honest. 
but what they're finding is they just don't have any cases to go after anymore because there's no reason to file a fraudulent case. I'm not saying that every single case now is legitimate, but it's such a small percent of what we see. Uh, and, you know, we have judges that on a regular basis will kick a case out. They said, you, you don't have a case here. It, you, you haven't proved, and that's the reality. They have to prove their case. They have to prove that their injury was caused at work to the judge's satisfaction, and then they have to get it past the three commissioners, and then they have to get it past the Supreme Court. That's a pretty long, potentially, that's a pretty long road to, to follow to get what are not spectacular benefits. Jim? Next question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jim. Didn't, in the last legislative session, didn't they raise some work and workers' comp taxes? Has that affected you? I, I'm not, I don't believe they did. Um, for the last three years, we've been trying to get a, uh, a cleanup bill passed. Whenever a large uh, bill that affects a lot of aspects of some part of state government uh, goes through the legislature, um, if, it's, if it's popular, and Charlie will back me up on this, if it's popular, it becomes a freight train. And it starts moving through the legislature and they don't read they don't. They don't give it enough uh, they don't read it. review. They don't, <laughs> they don't give it enough review. They start piling things on it because, hey, if that's going to pass, I want my stuff in it. And that's what happened with workers' comp reform. Uh, it was very popular and it roared through the legislature. We have about 30 items that we've identified because we have to implement it. We've identified identified about 30 items that just don't make any sense. And we have a bill that we put those things in. Uh, and we find a legislator to carry it. We don't lobby, we just develop the legislation, hand it off to a legislature and walk away, legislator and walk away. Uh, and it's up to them to push it if they care about workers' comp. Um, and uh, we've, we've tried now four years to get it passed. And that's, that's not atypical. Anything that is significant takes about three years to get through the legislature. Because the first year they laugh at it, the second year they study it, and the third year they pass it. Um, well, we've had some, we've had some political um, nets that have been holding us up. Th those, those nets are now gone, so we hope this year to get uh, a workers' comp bill passed that is a cleanup bill from the legislation from 85A. Uh, but nothing related to workers' comp has passed in the last four years. So I, I'd be very surprised if, if what you're suggesting has happened. I, I don't think it has. Um, the, the rates have been dropping, and that reminds me, if you're, if you're a business owner and your workers' comp rates are staying about the same over the last three or four years, you need to shop it. Uh, you're, you're, uh, because you should be seeing, on average, a 30% drop. That means some of you should be seeing more than a 30% drop in workers' comp rates. Now, the caveat is, in Texas, your rates would be half of that. So we do have a ways to go. Um, a friend of mine, or a former employee, um, also had Burger King restaurants. And her brother had Burger King restaurants in Texas, so they were able to compare notes on their workers' comp. Hers had dropped 50%, his were half of hers. So we have a ways to go in Oklahoma, but if you're not shopping your workers' comp, then you're missing out. You need to be have whoever is handling your workers' comp shop it around because um, you, you, you need to be taking full advantage. Well, thank you. This is great. Let's give him a hand here. Thank you. Thank you. As he, as he was speaking, I remembered a number of years ago, back in Charlie's days, when uh, Jason Murphy uh, came up to talk about finances uh, in the legislature and uh, I was stunned he was actually understandable <laughs> I've never heard a politician do anything but uh, pull the blinds over whatever it is he's saying so I appreciate it, it was very clear Good. and impressive very impressive well and, and uh, thank you Hopper for putting up with a frustrating <laughs> here. I, I do want to thank you all for your time and coming out uh, this is something that um, Hopper and I've been doing what I learned in the legislature, one of the things I learned is if you, if you leave a blank, then people fill it in themselves, and they tend to fill it in negatively. Yeah. So you need to be out there telling your story. Uh, and the other, uh, the other thing is, is if you don't blow your own horn, nobody else will. So we're out there 
we're talking to uh, uh, editorial boards, chambers of commerce, uh, uh, civic groups, uh, legislators who sometimes pull folks together for us to talk to. We're out there telling folks what's going on because they need to understand how their money's being spent and, and what this, the uh, system is. So thank you all very much for having us out today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I heard had one of his technical guys call to see if we had audio and visual. I, I didn't realize he wanted, he meant one that worked. Uh, so, uh, but this was great. It ties in with last week and Steve Anderson. And if you haven't watched the video or if you weren't here last week, you ought to watch the video of Steve Anderson. Really, really impressive. So thank you. Next week we're going to be debating the yes-no vote on uh, 793, uh, whether we should allow uh, retail outlets to sell glasses. Susan Goodman. Oh, yes. And if you're not a member of OPAC, uh, you can either get shot when you leave or, or just <laughs> go ahead and sign up. It's only $50, and your life is worth $50. So uh, please sign up for OPAC. It helps us fund great candidates like Jay Stiegel over here. And Jay, we hope to have you back. And uh, <clears throat> so we're going to close today. And I've, I've asked, uh, you're still running. You, you have an election in... That's right. We didn't fund you. See? Okay, so if more of you had been members, she probably would not have lost. That's, the, that's how that works. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Mike to close in prayer. Thank you. Lord, thank you once again for this meeting. We thank you, Lord, for this, this organization. And Lord, we thank you for principled people that are involved in our state government. And Lord, we do thank you that there are men and women that are looking to cut costs and do things according to biblical principles, Lord, to, to do it right. And Father, we just pray that you continue to watch over us and bless our state. Lord, help us to learn to do things your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you make a proposal.